our discussion of, of why you might want to use tracers or isotopes. And so I'll start this today. I'll go until about 12 or 12.05, um, stop for questions, and we'll pick up on this next time. Um, and there's, there's a lot of detail. This, this slide deck is already posted on Canvas, and it's 51 slides. Um, you know, this is, this is the bread and butter of Professor Antonio Witch's lab. Um, the, really, uh, this, the use of, of tracing and um, particularly doing it in innovative contexts, but also just understanding how to, how to get rich sets of information to improve flux predictions. And so um, this is a pretty well illustrated here, and I, I have not done this part. Um, so I'll give you a surface level um, kind of description uh, today and, and next Tuesday. Um, but the general idea here is that when you have these reactions taking place at a molecular level, if we go submolecular to an atomic level, um, you, you have actual atoms being passed back and forth. And you don't have that process occurring randomly. This is a key insight. Um, if you've got, for example, molecule A, where you've got little a, b, and c, and you've got molecule B, where you've got big A and big B, um, you have a, fundamentally, enzymes are moving, in this case, this atom A over to D. And, and that either that happens, uh, you know, that always happens at a fixed percentage of time, and usually it's just 100% of the time ending up in, in one place. Um, and so you can then see how, how if you knew where your, your A came from, your little a, then you can sort of track it. And this is really important, taking a step back, because in metabolism, you have a lot of reactions and pathways where um, basically pathways and molecules overlap or converge. You have this underdeterminedness generally, because if we're talking about something like pyruvate in the cell, pyruvate came from however many number of sources, anywhere between like three to five different biosynthetic reactions, and it then goes to all these other places. But if you could provide a precursor, uh, either immediately to pyruvate or further upstream, that gives you a signature that this is the molecule that came via this route, then you can tease apart the fluxes that from two different pathways or even one, you know, one nearby starting point arrive at the same destination. Um, so ordinarily, I'd ask you a lot more questions about that to see if you got it in class. But since I can't really follow your faces, I'm just going to keep going. I think the, that uh, general concept is probably clear or will become clear. Um, so how do you do C13 metabolic flux analysis? So well, it begins with this 13C labeled compound. Um, so using, taking advantage of radioactivity and this idea that 13C has a different mass um, than 12C, um, and therefore the compounds that contain 13C can be resolved by a mass spec and would have um, this different isotopomer distribution. I always say that weird, isotopomer. Um, so you've got your isotope, and then you have isotopomers. Um, and you can impose that information onto your metabolic model and calculate different metabolic fluxes uh, more accurately, more precisely, um, getting rid of some of the underdeterminedness. And uh, Professor Antonio Witch's software to do this is called Metran. So uh, we can go back, and this slide has some history, some of which is pretty interesting, others a little bit less so, but. You know, it's important to know that some of these methods have been around for a while and why people started doing this. Um, so in the 1930s, um, the pioneer in this area, Rudolf Schoenheimer, um, started to feed mice <laughs> isotopes, um, uh, in this case of fatty acids, so deuterated fatty acids. And the deuter the, a lot of the deuterium, most of the deuterium was still in the mice, um, so it had ended up getting stored in their fat reserves. Um, and then he could do this later with um, another, so these are different isotopes than 13C, and we can talk probably next time about why you might want to use one versus another. Um, so you've got uh, 
deuterium here, and then you've got um, N15. And Schoenheimen, uh, Schoenheimer found that most of the N15s were also in the mice. Um, so what this implied was that actually um, your, at least the mice's enzymes and normal meta metabolism didn't seem to really care uh, whether uh, a compound had an unnatural radioactive uh, radioisotope um, versus the normal um, isotope. And when you think about it, you know, it's interesting because uh, larger, a larger perspective in the field for a long time is that enzymes lock and key, only act on, on the one substrate. And so uh, modern view, um, a relatively new view is that enzymes can be highly promiscuous, act on lots of different substrates, and, and whether engineered or not. Um, but at a, before that, just sort of understanding, well, what, what about these atomic perturbations where now, um, instead of a 12-carbon, it's still glucose, but it's a 13-carbon. Is, is that actually going to be processed by the cell? And these were the first experiments that really said yes. Um, and so you know, you could see this, this area developing, these isotopic studies related to metabolism. It's a lot of, of work on the metabolic pathway discovery where they could be used to, to figure out um, and follow pathways uh, over a number of decades. Um, more recently, but still starting in the 80s, um, you had more technique-oriented, um, you know, measurement improvements. So this has to do with 13C NMR, GCMS, um, tandem mass spec. Um, and then um, the modeling that's associated with processing all of this information. Uh, you had innovations more in the 90s and, and 2000s and still today um, with uh, concepts like atom mapping, isotopomer mapping. Um, I don't know how to say this cumumer, it seems, um, and elementary metabolite units. Um, so again, the problem that we're trying to solve for here is that uh, you don't actually know what all your fluxes are, and this is especially complicated when you have multiple routes to the same molecule. Um, and so a lot of metabolic flux models will just assume that there's zero flux going on through pathways, just to make things simpler. Um, but they might be active and they also might be really active based on some perturbation that you've made. Um, so you need better accounting strategies. And in this sort of ranking or cataloging of, of different approaches, this is the idea that, um, I mean, here, I don't know if everyone would define metabolic flux analysis versus flux balance analysis so differently, but I think based on the images that are shown here, Metabolic flux analysis in, in this image is trying to say, well, okay, we're, we're going to have the stoichiometric matrix and the, the flux matrix, and we're going we're gonna to generate that by mapping out these reactions. And, and then we're just going to create this, the, the line that represents solution space. The flux balance analysis might be imposing over that a particular objective, like what the cell might want to do to maximize uh, the flux of ATP. And so when you have that overlaid, you end up at a particular point. Um, but this may be, for a variety of reasons, a really unrealistic destination. I mean, with uh, this kind of optimization, your, your cells can, can shift things in ways that don't reflect uh, reality. And when you actually use 13 carbon labeled um, MFA, you are following the fluxes through particular pathways. To me, this is less about actually trying to, to perform an analysis. Um, through modeling, even though it's intertwined. But to me, it just seems like this is how you experimentally obtain what the right um, distribution uh, of fluxes was and where you end up on this line. So that's what this is supposed to illustrate. Um, and uh, what's shown here, this 80-20% is something that we're going to come back to, not this time, but next time. But it's the key insight into understanding how these isotopes make a difference. because we're not just looking for you know, these black isotopes to end up on, on one molecule or not. We're also looking f at ratios. Because for example, in this case of E or F, what we want to know is, is the ratio between these compounds. Um, and then we can, we can make calculations.
And I think I'll just, well, I'll go quickly through a couple of other slides because I don't actually have too much to say about them. But this is it being applied to E. coli metabolism. And so this is the entner deuteroff pathway, um, which is related. Uh, it comes off of the pentose phosphate pathway. It's not the same pathway. Um, but this is meant to compare different routes to pyruvate. You can get there through glycolysis, pentose phosphate, or enter deuteroff. And um, this map is just a reflection of that. You know, pyruvate's here. Um, this, uh, the idea that I wanted to get to is that your atom transitions look really different than those three different routes to pyruvate. So this is if the flux went entirely through entner deuteroff. Um, now here you've got your six carbons of glucose. And we haven't assumed that any of them are labeled. We're just kind of, we're, we're saying effectively here that they're all different carbons and that we, if we could distinguish them, we would see an arrangement where you have one, two, three, 50% of your pyruvates and four, five, six. Whereas if it all went through the EMP pathway, uh, you'd have three, two, one, four, five, six. Maybe you're asking, how can you tell apart three, two, one from one, two, three? Well, these carbons are, are still attached right, and in, in all these molecules to, to other things. So these are not like symmetric, um, they, they would be distinguishable. Um, and here, what, what's interesting is if it goes through an oxidative uh, pentose phosphate pathway, um, you end up with this signature. Um, and so this is really, um, you know, the rest of the slide deck is going to make a lot of the same points as we just got to here, which is this is effectively how you can then use 13 carbon labeling to um, tell apart, uh, and not just tell apart, but to deconvolute um, and account for how much flux went through each of those pathways if they're all on at the same time.